Welcome back to the show. Of course, we are focusing on the debate over legalizing marijuana in Canada. We see examples all around the world now, uh, our closest neighbors in the United States and Washington State to British Columbia, Colorado as well, uh, of an evolving policy when it comes to marijuana. Should Canada follow in the footsteps of what we're seeing in some of the U.S. states? Our next guest certainly has some pedigree and a variety of different perspectives to bring to this conversation. Cash Heat is a former MLA for Vancouver Fairview, former Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, former Chief Constable of the West Van Police Department, former superintendent with the VPD, and now he is a coalition member of Stop Violence BC. Cash, how are you? I'm fine. Pleasure to be on your show. Well, I really appreciate your time. And and like I say, boy, you have a lot of experience in, in different areas of this. I mean, from policing to governance. Uh, why? First of all, tell us about Stop the Violence. Well, Stop the Violence uh, BC was an organization that was created to deal with marijuana prohibition as it relates to violence. So we've got several key individuals that have come out in support of uh, removing marijuana under the prohibition laws here in Canada, attorney generals, academics, solicitor generals, serving police officers, former police officers, and key individuals that have a say in developing policy, not only uh, in municipal government, but certainly in the provincial government and uh, the federal government. We've even had former federal prosecutors uh, from the United States and local prosecutors come out and support of removing marijuana from prohibition laws in Canada. Number one, to deal with the violent nature of people that are involved in marijuana trafficking. Is that what drove you uh, towards this coalition and towards this this way of thinking when it comes to uh, you know being anti-prohibition and obviously thereby pro-legalization? Well, I was I never uh, I didn't hold these feelings all my police career. I spent 31 years in policing. In the majority, especially as a young officer, I honestly believe that we could arrest our way out of any drug problem we had with the Vancouver Police Department. I returned to uh, Simon Fraser University, finished my undergrad degree, then finished my graduate degree, and then started teaching. And at the same time, started moving throughout the ranks in the Vancouver Police Department. So I was combining my practical knowledge with my academic experiences. And as you can imagine, I started to have a shift in the way I thought. And then uh, when I was a commanding officer of the drug unit for the Vancouver Police Department, at a time where we had a proliferation of marijuana grow-ups here in the city of Vancouver, and we had to do something to deal with them. So I actually hold the record for the largest interdiction of supply of marijuana and arrests of individuals involved in drug trafficking in general <laughs> than any other uh, uh, drug officer across this particular nation. And I now, Cash, you might be responsible or at least part of the voice that, that changes all well, that. Absolutely. And, and what really uh, made me shift my uh, way of thinking is when I testified in front of the Pierre Nolan, the Senate Commission in 2001, and I identified the flaws with prohibition, not only in Vancouver, but elsewhere in Canada, and why we had to look at a contemporary way of dealing with this particular situation. So that was the beginning, and that was 2001. So I spent the last 13 years trying to move from prohibition to a pragmatic policy around marijuana here in Canada. Uh, let's talk about that pragmatic policy. I mean, what does that look like to you? To someone with experience in this, obviously stopping the violence is, is a key component of it, but, but what does a pragmatic marijuana legislation and law look like? Legalization and regulation of the adult use of marijuana here in Canada. Now, we have this taking place. Uruguay is the first country to outright legalize the adult use. Remember, we're talking about the adult use, not yes. uh, young kids being involved in this. Isn't that part of it as well, is, is when you regulate... Uh, you are trying to keep it away from the youth. That's, that's one Absolutely. of the points because it's not right now. Mike, you're right on because I can tell you right now, our kids have easier access to marijuana than they do tobacco uh, and alcohol Cash, based I've on our policies. I've got a 16-year-old. I know. I, she tells me. She knows. Uh, and it's, it's a reality for teenagers. Well, I have a six-year-old girl, and I don't want her to have to go through what a lot of teenagers are experiencing right now. So I want to make sure that we are able to prevent our youth from trying any drugs to begin with, ab not abusing drugs, not abusing alcohol and tobacco. So those are prevention programs that we have to put in place throughout our education system for our children's 
right from kindergarten right to their uh, college years. So as we look around, I mean, you mentioned Uruguay, then you can look at Colorado now. Uh, Washington State is certainly getting close to, uh, to beginning their full program. Uh, what is the model that you look at? I mean, is it like alcohol sales? Is it like cigarette sales? How do we regulate well, this? Well, I've been following uh, what has occurred in the Netherlands and then what occurred in the United States with Colorado and Washington. And you know, in my opinion, they've moved further left than the Netherlands, right, uh, yeah. Colorado and Washington. Colorado, uh, their uh, regulation and legalization was driven primarily by the medicinal marijuana industry. Washington State, we have a different uh, perspective on it. It's more of a controlled industry similar to alcohol and tobacco. And uh, from what I understand in my studies and looking around and watching these experiments uh, in Canada, and I'll, I'll tell you, Mike, in three to five years, we will have uh, legalization of the adult use uh, of marijuana for recreational purposes here in Canada. And, and, and it'll be controlled, in my opinion, should be controlled the way we control alcohol here in Canada. So I'm hoping that's a system we adopt here in Canada versus uh, what is going on in Colorado. What makes you certain of that? Or what makes you state that? The pressures, the international pressures. You have the United States that has two states in full legalization of the adult use, gaining tax dollars from that versus organized crime benefiting from the marijuana industry. The, the demand is, has been consistent for years and will remain consistent and I can tell you 60% of all illicit drug profits worldwide come from marijuana. So you can see the significant <laughs> demand uh, yes, for this true. product. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, based on prohibition policies we've had since the war on drugs came into effect when uh, Nixon uh, announced that, you know, yeah. over 48, almost 50 years, uh, we haven't been able to change what's going on. And matter of fact, when you look at marijuana, you look at you know, the habitual use versus the addictive use of this particular uh, natural plant, you've got to look at a different policy. And the policy yeah. is, uh, you know, it's going to be, be legalized. And, and when you have these two states, you have um, 20 states right now that have medicinal marijuana on their books. 12 more are looking at it. So you're going to have, uh, in my opinion, 32 states uh, have medicinal marijuana to legalization and several states are moving towards referendums for the legalization of the adult use. Cash, what about, uh, this always comes up whenever we talk about uh, legalizing marijuana, what about decriminalizing? Uh, what's the difference and, and what would be the effect of decriminalization versus full legalization? Well, in Vancouver, we have de facto decriminalization yeah. right now based on the police discretion that's utilized each and every day in Canada. Matter of fact, it's a very inconsistent policy across uh, right. across Canada. Matter you could fact, smoke a joint in Vancouver, but if you do it in Saskatoon, oh, you're, you're going to jail. And, and your, your life could be ruined. A yeah. young kid's life could be ruined because of the, the inconsistency of the policy. And, you know, if we don't do anything about this right now, the Supreme Court's going to have to rule on it because in, in my 31 years, as far as marijuana goes and the discretion utilized by officers, you won't find it any more so in the Vancouver area than you will for any other criminal code offense. So, right. you know, it is going to come. So when you look at the pressures externally, when you look at what's happened here under the medicinal marijuana regulations, going through more of a corporate commercialized structure for the distribution of medicinal marijuana, it's like a perpetuating pattern towards yeah. the legalization. So I'll tell you, in three to five years, no matter who's in power, whether it's the Harper government, the Trudeau government, even the McClare government, uh, you are going to have, in my opinion, uh, in my estimation, a legalized market for the adult use. Well, and decriminalization also doesn't take care of one of those essential factors, which is getting the control away from gangs, people that are then using that money for violence, for for other drugs, for guns, for whatever well, it is. Absolutely. We we track the marijuana distributed from BC, you know, the famous BC bud, to markets down the United States. And we found that these gangs and the organized crime groups were actually trading pound for pound of marijuana for cocaine, bringing it back, or a pound of marijuana for a series of guns that they could bring back across the border and cause havoc on the streets here in Vancouver. So decriminalization um, will actually just keep these c criminal keep organization place. groups making a lot of money. And we're still going to have to deal with the consequences of uh, marijuana prohibition laws, whether you go to decriminalization at all, without any benefit of tax dollars. When you look at Colorado and you look at Washington, they've earmarked 
where those tax dollars are going to go to schools the schools and uh, health care, education, education yeah. all those costly items uh, that we face here as citizens here in British Columbia. So we have to make sure that we're the ones, the citizens of BC, the citizens of Canada are benefiting from it versus organized crime. Cash, a pleasure. Really appreciate your time today and thank you for your insights. My pleasure, Mike. All right, I'll talk to you in three years and we'll find out yes. where we are. <laughs> Take care. And on May 26, it's your turn to have a say. Canadians talk marijuana on your local chorus station.